the, the Knights of Tribute, the one we had today. It was a very beautiful evening. It was mainly held by his friends to celebrate his life. And I felt that it was excellent, excellently done, because it was people who had known him for 63 years, 65 years. So I can imagine um, you know, the, 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 the things they know about my father. So it was such a beautiful evening, mainly because it was done by his friends. For someone who has achieved the most or achieved a lot, like my father, we're going to give him a befitting funeral. So be prepared for um, the, 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 you know, the, the, what do you call it, the masquerades, Igerasira, the Ede rooms, and the attires, you know. So those are the sort of things, and I've, of course, a lot of food because my dad loved food. Um, so that's what people uh, should expect. It was for rich, it was for poor, it was for everyone. So one of the legacies he would leave is friendship, love, kindness, courage, um, mm. quite emotional. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning. I'm <laughs> Amen. <laughs>
the late Alawak Graham Douglas um, was uh, my first cousin. His mother and my father were brothers and sisters. He was uh, a great man, quite gregarious, making friends, never eats alone. You, you can never disturb him. Even sometimes you walk in on him and he's having his tears. I said, no, 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 come in. Always eating with people. He never ate alone. He never ate alone and knows everyone up to the housemates. I remember one incident. He came to my house in Lagos and I just had a new maid, a new boy. His name was Akpan. And I'm so difficult in remembering names. He came in the next time and said, ah, Akpan, how are you? That's, that's the kind of person he is. He touched lives. He was helpful, making friends. He was a good man. And the legacy he left behind, look at the hall. The whole hall is filled with people. Everyone everywhere coming in. No seats to sit in. That's the kind of person. So what is the special thing you've missed about him? I miss him so much because he has the fond fondness of giving you a nickname. My name is Ngo, but then he made sure he made it as an NGO. So everybody now knows me as NGO. So NGO, how are you? So I, I, I don't know. I, I miss him greatly. He, he, he was. He'll be greatly missed. he be greatly Ah, I love my brother. I call him T.O.G. T.O.G. Rest in peace. We'll miss you.
For how else can we, friends and associates of the great and laboratory young program, Douglas, speak of him? Shall we have some quiet on the side, please, kindly? Order. For how else, what am I now? Um, I don't want to mention him, except to mention him in isolation. Without a delve into his pedigree, in truth, will be incomplete. Such a narrative will take away from him. A description in that you would miniaturize him. For he was indeed born great, multidimensionally huge, and truly the last chief of the golden block. A superb assembly of quintessential him, quintessential siblings. Let's for now leave alone the daughters, who made incomparable impact on their hometown and on human. Their own country, Nigeria, indeed, wherever they found themselves on Mother Earth. Their father, Graham Douglas, popularly known in Kalawari as Urubiye Graham, the chief and head of Urubiye House of Aboliman, like Nostradamus, the French astrologer, physician, and reputed seer, was the man who saw tomorrow find excess of his time. He noticed comprehended and correctly interpreted the implications of the rapid changes the world was undergoing even at this time and concluded that the future would belong to the educated. So he spared no effort whatsoever in ensuring that the children were soundly and roundly educated. Bennett taught in various schools all over the former Eastern Nigeria and produced professionals, academics, politicians, and rulers, judge, and astute civil servant. In the colonial civil service of Nigeria, he was cultured, he was measured, on a zooming, and temperate in all he did. He ensured that government policies were executed to the letter. Melford Semawo was a pediatric surgeon who in his capacity then as a registrar of the medical Council of Nigeria, administered the Hippocratic Oath to me as a young doctor and received me into the medical profession in July 1969 in Lagos, Nigeria. Just as he did to hundreds of physicians and dentists from all over the country. He later became the first permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health of the newly created state in 1970. And in that capacity served as the focal point of the establishment of that ministry. Donald. Master of the bench, Chief George of River State for several years, exquisitely satirical, had the last word as far as the interpretation of the law in River State went during this time. Napoleon became more. Later, Napo, Napo, somehow I prefer Napo, which was the name we all knew him by as kids when we were running about in Abolima. Nigeria's first senior advocate was Attorney General in the former Eastern Nigeria, where he advised against secession and resigned. He was arrested, he was locked up in Enugu, from where he was relieved by federal troops during the Nigerian Civil War, and became the first Attorney General and Commission of Justice of River State, and thereafter, that of the Nigerian Federation. He also served as the Director General of the Nigerian Law School. Then, <clears throat> God will ally a bigger brother to all of us. Another senior advocate of Nigeria, a thoroughbred gentleman, very successful private practitioner. They were all criminals, role models. They were all chiefs, each in his own rights. And all of them, they each bore with alarming dignity. Such a star studded, aristocratic, Overclass background of affluence and opulence, visibility and fame, success and prosperity, almost totally devoid of failure. I thought it would be a last song, as the Toya Uba was, would ordinarily have induced indolence. It would have encouraged complacency and foisted stuffiness and conceit in the life of the young man. But all this was not to be with the young Tango Toya Uba as he appeared determined to carve a niche for himself and to add and not depend upon 
In natural circumstances, he had been so privileged to her. Greatness that was trust on him. Besides, he was resolute to achieve greatness. Primary and secondary schools passed quickly, and the bachelor's degree from the University of Lagos set Toyin on the path to an exciting and fulfilled life. Starting with a brief stint in the managerial positions in the oil industry, which was then embryonic in Nigeria, Toyin quickly discovered that only politics, only business and culture, we accommodated the big frame and heart, such as he had, and I called him over the years. He stepped out, and before long, he was with the high and mighty, the strong and powerful, rich and affluent, but also, by his nature, with the brilliance and the holy glory, poor and deprived, weak and defenseless, within and outside Nigeria. Two times Commission of River State, four times Minister in the Federal Republic of Nigeria, a business mongol, property developer, shrewd politician, celebrated philanthropist, one of the founder, founding fathers of the People the, the, um, Democratic Party of Nigeria. He had humongous reach, an instant beguiling presence, and an immutable quality of standard wherever he was. Being the last, it was as if the heavens opened up and supernaturally endowed him with all the positive attributes of his forebears. Personal, material wealth, spiritual empowerment, right down to the nature of the content, size, and style in all he did. Ostensibly his students, colorful, dignified, elegant, mystifying, and distinctive. It was he who popularized the term Alago. Calabari nomenclature for a chief, in place of chief, to the extent that many mistook it for his name. Alawa's demise has created an enormous vacuum, which his children fortunately that are doing well will have to feel. For those of us, his friends and associates who love him, his memory will not wither presently. Um, this is about Alabo Graham Douglas and we're seeing just one part of the many parts of him and this part about the uh, choral musical night has been organized by his friends who have known him for uh, seven decades eight decades and it's a beauty to just come and remember him and just be in this kind of attitude, uh, environment so I am very, very happy. My father has been part of this, and it's a great day. Okay, so what's the relationship between you and the late Alabo? <laughs> so it's a very deep relationship. I was born in his hands when he was the first person to carry me because my father was not here when he came. So I'm named after him. His name, Tamnotane, is my name. He gave me the name. A close friend. Somebody that we have been with since the early 40s. We sit here this evening to mourn. And when you mourn, you sing a sad song. But in our mourning, we also rejoice that in this brief life, we have the privilege to know Alago Graham Douglas. He was faithful to us in a way which we couldn't claim to have been faithful to him. But as we weep, as we try and come out of this depth of so we place our faith in him our faith in the God which he worshipped and our belief that he was merely somebody who was shining the light and he's challenged all of us all of you to be better than himself to serve your people and to lead a great life.
sad time for us, even though we're celebrating his life, Alabo Graham Douglas. To me, he, he was a father to me and somebody that from when I was a child uh, played a, a very important role in my life till today. Um, we have a unique relationship and uh, the, the unique relationship this hardly happens, but um, his sister, his older sister is my grandmother, and his mother is my auntie. That's unique. So, from my grandfather's side, I'm related to him, and my other side, I'm related. So, my mother was, is late, is late. It's now, but she was one of the most important person in his life, my mother. And because of that, everybody around us was important to him. Uncle was a, a man of the people, and he never forget people. He loved people. He wasn't a perfect, a perfect person. He was always trying to perfect himself when it came to people. He, he loved people. He loved his children. He loved his cousins. He loved all his relatives. And he played a part in everybody's lives. There's nobody he left out. That's what was unique about him. They don't, they don't make him cool as they do now. You can never get another Alabo. You can never get him. Present and so on. In fact, uh, I wasn't prepared for this, to be honest with you, because I am terribly grieving that the least uh, in God that wants to spare me this quotation. Um, but, however, we must speak about our elder brother our friend. In fact, I was telling Uncle Tom and Uncle Dede a few hours ago that throughout yesterday after our meeting with Sir Francis and so on, the song came to me and I was humming it. I don't know the whole tune. I think it has something spiritual about Alabo, my big brother. We've been very, very extremely close. That when I, well, on his uh, 83rd birthday, we were in London, he said, we need all of us for Tom and um, Daily Cole. We used to saying, trying to encourage him. He has gone through a lot. But when I saw him, I was to travel on the 23rd of April to Dubai and route to London, US. And I was praying, my wife and myself. And the Spirit said, do not travel without going to Seattle. And I wouldn't have forgiven myself. So I left Lagos to Abuja. And though we going and seeing him and praying with him and so on, but then he, he was talking. But this time when we went, I went with an ambassador Gali with the wife to see him at the ICU. And when you saw him, that was gone. Spiritually was done. We were with him. And I did the last prayer for him. Gave him the sign of the cross. 
and I left on the 23rd. I arrived on the 24th, on the 25th, and I would die, passed away. But I thank God Almighty that I was able to see him at his last hour. I thank God. Arabo was the only person that I had to buy a, a private jeep and packed. I would not use that car. Only Arabo and the wife moved there until that car. I dispose of it because when he's not able to come to Lagos again, what's the car going there? We were very close. And you know, Alabo, we all learned how to dress from Alabo. <laughs> all of us. <laughs> and I make bold to say that in the Jordan, apologies to anybody who's offended, who gets offended. After Alabo's blessing, it's for Luki. <laughs> because the culture of dressing, and about dressing, very imposing. If you take a look at this, this is true. But we thank God. We thank God for all the friends here who have put this together with us to honor Him. That's the least we can do. May he so rest in perfect peace. Thank you all. We have the speakers before me said, we've come here today not to mourn, but to celebrate life. Life of a great Calabari son, of a great German, of a great Nigerian. It's always something to remember Alago, his genuineness, his honesty, his sincerity in friendship, his love for brotherhood. Alago, from the time I met him through my wife Gwendolyn, have remained someone you could call upon in distress and be told the truth. When I sat with them in cabinet, in a military government, Alamo would speak so boldly about the need to be fair, equitable, and just to all Nigerians. He spoke so strongly about the sort of control that the people from which Nigeria derived most of our oil, or all of our oil, and most of our money, must also be looked after properly. Alamo in death. Those of us who knew what you did for your people and for Nigeria would always praise and remember you. Alamo and your family would pray unity, understanding, love, and care for each other and for your people and for Nigeria. God bless you. Alamo was the closest person to me in life. And I've been with him throughout all these years. And today's occasion is to honor him. That's the least we can do. Devoid of any rancor and so on. And he loves music, both the choral music and the native music. And that's why we've organized this tonight. But what to are honor the things that you missed about him? You know, things that you love that you missed about him. What I'm missing about him is that he's no more. He's the companionship is, will not be there again. You know, so we, the, nobody can fill up that space. Nobody. You know, but what can we do? We can't question God. You know, there's a fantastic guy. It's irreplaceable. <laughs> but I choose to see this as an opportunity to speak for all of us who are younger friends to the great man, Alabo T. O. Graham Douglas. Much, much more exposed than all of us, older than all of us. Than some of us. But took all of us as his friends. And whenever he had a celebration, there was one thing I remarked. 
Allah would ensure that everybody had enough to eat and enough to drink. It's painful to us that such a great man, with all his majesty, handsome and, uh, you know, dignified, could pass at this time. But we all are aware that this death, this thing called death, as Julius Caesar was told, is a necessary end and will come when it will come. I knew him as a young man. One of his mothers in law was my neighbor at number 12. She was at number 10 while I was at number 12. Madame Kitibu. And that was where our relationship really started. And he took all of us as his brothers. And when the children, most of them, the Mabo, Otoba, the rest of them, all our children, and indeed his first son, Toy, we all associated with them. And of course, his uh, young nephew, Duboe, the son of our late chief. But Alaba was a great man. Many have said how he dignified the river's attire. And many of all of us, uh, Ephraim says, uh, after Alaba, he is the next best dressed river's man. <laughs> uh, well, okay, Ephraim, you are now a Bielsa man. We are river's man. <laughs> so we have many dignified and well dressed river's men. But uh, we thank God for his life. And we can only pray the Almighty and eternal God to grant his soul eternal rest in peace. And thank you all for listening. I grew up in the shadows of Graham Douglas' legacy. My uncle Nam Ford, my uncle Nam my uncle Lama Nebi, my uncle Donald, my uncle Ono, and of course my dad. I never knew I was a woman until I left my father's house. He raised me as a human being with abilities. Fortunately, the values he instilled in me, confidence, courage, compassion, and the ability that I could do anything, regardless of my gender, became firmly rooted in my character. Which gave me the strength to overcome many obstacles that I otherwise wouldn't have. I was born about probably about nine, ten months or thereabouts after my grandmother died. And as far as my dad was concerned, I was his mother that had come back to him. So he called me, Bekinwari, after her, and then mommy for such a long time, and then Momo. Well before the awareness of women's rights in Nigeria, I was fortunate to be blessed as a young girl growing up with a pioneer in the advocacy for women's rights. I fully remember as a young girl, I was about maybe 10, my dad came back from work fatigued, he would have his dinner, change, and ask me to sit with him. He said, me mom, you know you're priceless. You, me mom, you know you're strong. Me mom, you know you can really do anything. That became our daily mantra. I was so blessed to have a father who wasn't threatened by strength and saw it as an advantage to succeed. As a young girl, I fell in love with my dad and my older brother, Tony, my late brother, Tony, my late dad and my late brother, Tony. I was intrigued by both of them. I guess they reminded me of each other. I cried every time my dad traveled and waited for him by the door until he came back from work. I followed him everywhere as a young girl. He went in the house until that bond was broken when I went to boarding school in Nigeria. My dad loved to travel and he did that a lot. I always looked forward to his return after an eventful trip. I remember in 1988, he went to the Olympics held in Seoul, Korea, South Korea. I was so excited beyond words for his return as I was sure to get treats as well as juicy stories from travel. At that time, there was no satellite TV and we didn't have the luxury of watching the Olympics in real time. His stories were very captivating and he was sure to add extras just to make me happy and hear me laugh. As I grew older, I became my own person and our relationship had, grown, had now grown into friendship. Those luxury trips that were once dreams to me now came alive as my dad allowed me to explore the world. My dad lived very large. He loved the best of everything, especially food. 
<laughs> and that allowed me to be dined and wine at the best restaurants the world had, had to offer. I can't talk about my dad without his everyday banquet. It was at that table I learned a lot about politics and vital life lessons. At first, I listened only as I was fascinated by his wisdom and knowledge. Then I became confident to contribute. And he said, me mom, my student has become eloquent. Well done. I remember when I went to boarding school in England. My dad came to visit with his friends. He turned up in a limousine. He walked out of the car like an emperor, a monarch, dressed in his usual elegant attire. And his objective was realized as the moment he had intimidated everyone and left, I was called African Princess from Nigeria. <laughs> Every time we shared that story, we both giggled and laughed because that was just what my dad would do to make anyone happy. I met my husband, Lulu, in sixth form. He was known to everyone, my mother, my brothers, everyone except my dad. I was too terrified to tell my dad I had a boyfriend. Whether he knew and pretended not to will forever remain a mystery to me. He met him finally before we got married and loved him like a son. On my traditional wedding day, I was an excited bride. Until my sister, Boma, ran into the room giggling and said, Momo, daddy is crying. My heart tore to pieces. I knew why he was crying. He didn't want me to go. I too began to cry. On my wedding day, we both cried from his house in GRA to St. Prince Church, Port Harcourt. As we arrived in the car at the church, the former president, Ibrahim Babangida, approached the car to wish me well. And my dad said, Nimo, let's stop crying. Look at all the people who have come to honor us. We cried down the aisle until I exchanged my vows. My dad was my confidant and the first person we told I was pregnant. He was so excited to become a granddad That's that he organized, yes, <laughs> so excited to become a granddad that he organized a delivery party with my brothers, sisters, and relatives at the Portland Hospital in England. A number of people the Portland Hospital had never seen in their life. My first daughter, my first child, Zara, came into the world ushered in in style by a very lovable grandfather. Tragedy came calling when I lost one of my twins after birth in 2004. I was so broken. But when my dad heard the news, he held me so tight and willed his heart out. I found comfort knowing he understood my pain. He held on to my daughter, Ariel, and loves her dearly. My third child was very eventful. My dad heard I had gone into labor for my, for my son, Zachary. He got on the British Airways flight from Lagos at 10.50. I arrived at the Portland Hospital at about 5 o'clock. I was tired and my husband, lying next to me, gave me a slight nod to see, look who is here. Joy unspeakable. Joy unspeakable exploded in my heart. He said, Mimo, I want to be the first person to carry my grandson, Zachary, with the traditional injury at the Calabari Club. My fourth child, Ariana, very strong. My dad called her Madam President because he felt that he had found someone to give back everything I had given to him. I learned hard work from my dad and I triumphed in business. Of all my endeavors, the one I made the most success of, successful of was a secret portion from my dad. My dad and I suffered from very dry skin. He came up with a solution and it worked. I took the secret to London, packaged and make a success of it. My dad wept with joy when he saw the figures and he blessed the works of my hand. I can't say this without, my dad and I had our differences. Like my auntie Boma said, my dad quarreled a lot. He always was always, but he quarreled with love, like auntie Boma said. So we did have our differences, but I think people understood not to interfere. As we always made up and gossiped about those who thought they could talk about us. My dad became very ill. The passing of my older brother, Twain Graham Douglas Jr., hit him very hard and he was unable to deal with it. I would say one of the contributing factors to his death. I was so fortunate and blessed to bond with him for the last six months of his life. I shot monthly from London to Abuja just to spend time with him. And that was the greatest gift I gave myself. The greatest gift I gave myself. The last time I saw my dad was in March 2022. I prayed for him, and I kissed him, and I told him how much I loved him. 
and I said, I love you. He said, I know. Very, very, he was weak. And I said, tell me you love me. Very, very weak. He said, I love you. I'm so glad I did. Daddy, you are my gift from God. You are the best father any woman would have just had. You will forever me the love of my life. I miss you. I miss your whistles. He always whistles everybody's name. Thank you for letting me be me regardless. Your secret potion will be made known to the world and I will continue to walk and walk. Rest in peace, the love of my life. Until we meet again. Thank you, Betty. First, we've heard, and uh, following Mama's speech, it's going to be tough uh, because she's, you really spoke from the heart. And everyone who has come here, uh, my uncles, my father, have all spoken dearly and deeply from the heart. So first, let me just observe all the protocols. Uh, please excuse me that I would not be able to recognize everyone, but Okulungo has already recognized so many. I grew up with some very, very great men. Um, I grew up in the house of Napoleon Douglas from the age of seven till 15. The first person to receive me, and he was so proud to tell everybody who cared to hear this, that because my father was away studying, he stood by my mother and was the first one to receive me on this earth. And by that honor alone, he gave me his name. I don't know whether he has my father, but I became twin by virtue of uncle They say in politics, one of the things that you need is name recognition. Everyone mistook my name, not Tony Cole, as Tony Graham Douglas. So I would be called Tony Graham Douglas so often, and I would say, no, it's Tony Cole. <laughs> but that was because of the presence he had made that name, Tony, recognizable all over Nigeria. He made that possible. And so wherever I went, I was associated with him, and I was proud to know that I had an uncle called Tony Graham Douglas. My earliest memories of him was of a whistling uncle because I would come with uh, Big Daddy, so our, our home just had all sorts of names. So Big Daddy was Apple Graham Douglas. My father was uncle for a long time. We grew up calling my father uncle, Uncle Dilly, I don't know why. <laughs> my mom was auntie. Uh, mommy, Big Mommy was Uncle Napo's. Wife, she brought me up, so she was mommy, she was daddy. But we walked to Uncle Lete's house, and as we walked in every holiday, the first thing that would all be welcomed with were whistles for everybody. I can't remember what whistle my own was, but one mama had a whistle, Titi had a whistle. We all had me, that's how he called us. He was always open. And so I remember growing up in a lot of love. I remember growing up with someone who respected us right from when we were children. He never spoke to us as children, he spoke to us as adults from when we started growing up. And that gave us the confidence, and Mama talked about it, it gave us the confidence to be able to talk to people of all ages with respect because he taught us to respect our elders. He never belittled us, none of us was ever known, we were never little. Uncle Ite taught us about, yeah, he loved to talk about Calabari history, Calabari culture. He made us proud to be Calabarians, proud wherever we went. He taught us that we were not minorities in any way. You're only minority if you allow yourself to be minority in your thinking. He made sure that we were able to stand on our own anywhere we went. And my uncles and aunties sitting down here will attest to that fact that we were never cowed by anyone. They taught us all of that. Every single person sitting down here was never cowed, and we grew up with that. And that was Uncle Ite's legacy to us. Uncle Ite fought a lot with almost everyone. But as Momo said, he loved a lot. So there will be fights, there will be, we'll be upset with him sometimes. But we could always go to him and talk to him about those fights. He was always right, if you know what I mean. 
Kalite never accepted that he was wrong. Never. Not once did he ever say, no, 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 I wasn't right about that. However, he listened. And so we always try to make peace about it. You could never, I don't know about him, I guess everyone, you could never be too upset with him, even when he was fighting. We always found a way to forgive each other. I think the most precious time for me were his last days. In his last days, I visited him quite a bit. We were there with Momo, with the children as well. In bed, in his sick bed. And I think the most precious time there was he would lie down and he would see everyone. He always liked people around him. But his most precious time now, it wasn't the large crowd. It was just a small crowd of family. And on Kulite would sit down and sometimes he would start to cry. And I guess he's been crying for a long time. Ago. And he would start to weep. And I said, oh, why are you crying? Just said, just to have my children and all of you around me. And that was special for him all the time. Just the fact that he had people around him. He always liked people. And so the last few days before he passed on, we knew he was going. So I got a call that come. And I went to see him. myself and Sarita. I think we were there together. He could hardly talk there. But he was still insisting that we should go and read his book that he had written about politics. And he was trying, struggling to tell me that he has fought this fight, that Calabari must be had a governor, and that even though he's not there to see it, he has fought enough for it to happen. His last words. And so for me, standing here and pushing, I'm standing on the shoulder of people who have fought this fight, and they have gone far. Uncle Niti has lifted me up further and anybody who I would say in the struggle has done. And I owe him that. And I owe all my uncles and my aunties. I'm calling my dad uncle now because he's sitting there. <laughs> but it's a lot. I grew up calling him uncle. So I owe all of them the fact that they have put me on their shoulders, including Uncle Nungo here, who had carried me. <laughs> and he was a witness to it. And so I just want to say to Uncle Ite and the spirit that he has lived on, that he's still alive with all of us. And the testimony of us standing here today is to say he's a great man. We will not try to fill his shoes. He taught us to wear our own shoes. And I think we're wearing it well. God bless. Thank you very much. But you didn't talk about your father here. You acknowledge everybody. You didn't acknowledge your father. Uncle Ite, Alabo. He was always there for every one of us, like my cousin Barista Boma and my cousin Professor Kinta mentioned. For me personally, every time my wife put to bed in England, Uncle Ite was always at the hospital amongst the first to welcome the birth of all our children. Every single one of them, he was always there. I don't know how he did it, but every time I mentioned, oh, my wife has gone abroad, he was always there. And all of them were born at different times. Uncle Lete taught us many things. His generosity to others was something that he learned, or maybe he acquired from his brothers, but again, he perfected it. And like people have testified here today, he actually had an open heart. Every time he came to his house, it just so happened that there will always be food there. There will always be entertainment there. He always had something up his sleeve that would help you and relax you and adhere you to the kind of person he was. Our uncle and our father made us realize that there was something special in the family. Even many of us didn't see it, but he made us have a dignity. He made us have a presence of the fact that as a family, we could work together or we should work together to stand by the principles our great fathers had left. And I'm talking of his senior brother, Uncle Malford, Uncle Napoleon, 
my father, Uncle Anna Yebiga. And he taught us how to reach out and make friends of many people. And my senior brother, OCJ, has said it all. He made us realize that differences did not make you not have friends with people. Even when you have differences, you used to always tell us, make sure you maintain a relationship with that person. Oglete was a binder for us as a family. He made us realize and share hope. Even when we had issues with some parts of the town, it did not stop us from having relationships with those same parts of the town. It's unfortunate that it's passed on now and left quite a few things unresolved. But I believe and I trust that the spirit of our late uncle, Uncle Tom, Uncle Dilly, his very good friends who grew up with him and are still here to guide us, will help us as a family and bind us together. I speak on behalf of all of us in the family or some of us in the family. And I dare say that we will really miss him. We will sadly miss him. I remember the last time I spoke to him and the things he mentioned to me. And I pray God that the wisdom that guided him to the heights that he achieved, to the relationships that he kept, and to the relationships that he built, that we will adhere to them as individuals in the family and be able to size up to his big feet. His brothers wore from size 15 down to size 12. I happen to have the same size as my uncle, but unfortunately, we can't measure up to him. It is with total submission to the will of God that we celebrate our great uncle, our great father. And today, as I stand here, I humbly pray that his soul will rest in perfect peace in the bosom of the Lord. Allowed me granddaughters. At his 82nd birthday, he was full of life. We ate, drank, teased him. He was ill, fine, but he hadn't given up life at all. He was happy, and that was typical. And all he wanted was to, to bask the love of his loved ones. Well, there we had this him, and uh, as usual, I will call in between our laughter, I will call him Bro D D, and you say, my sweetheart. That was always the way he greeted us, and he had names for everybody. Being with him was fun, because nothing was pure in the bit. He could say anything, he could tell us, all sorts of things that he would say should not should this be said or discussed with your nieces. Or you know, we were used to it. For instance, when he got married, believe it or not, my sister and I followed him on his honeymoon. <laughs> honeymoon, my mother said, Who ever takes nieces along on their honeymoon? Don't do that. He said, What's wrong with that? That's what are we going to be doing? Watching your what? Kiss your wife and what? He said, no, come along on the first leg of the honeymoon. And we did. We went with him for about a week and came back. He was just somebody you could not forget. He was always there. Always there. Faithful. He would fight with you. We fought on many occasions. But they would make up. And he would just um, it will make you realize that, look, don't waste your energy, dissipate your energy fighting with me. Because 
I will always have the last word anyway. So for those of us that live in Lagos, if I told him anything, oh, children getting married, he was there. In London, he was there. Everything concerning all of us, his nieces and nephews, and I stand here to talk about him concerning his love for us. His nieces and nephews, we all fought with him at one time or the other, but he still remained a very loving, faithful, dependable uncle. He was always good to us, much more than we were good to him. And I look back and um, when the, 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 the news of his death came, I couldn't cry because, well, I had been crying. I had lost my husband two years ago. And I said to myself, don't cry. Look on the good things. Look on the bright side. God has been merciful to him. God has been gracious. Look at all what God has blessed him with. Many people are crying to have half of what he had. God has been good to him in many ways, uncountable ways, innumerable blessings, immeasurable blessings. He had the love of family. He had good health. He enjoyed good health. And even though we teased him, because you know, if you ate with him, you will see he had a special bag and he had all kinds of bags and things. I said, this is a mobile pharmacy you have here. <laughs> all of us, he said, he would recommend if you said you had an ache anywhere, he would open his medicine bag and he would recommend a tablet for you. He enjoyed good health. He enjoyed the love of family and friends. All his friends have attested to it that he was faithful, sincere, good man to have around, to have as a friend and as a relative, as an uncle. We have always been proud of him. That is it. Everybody that knows us, everybody that knows me, knows that Alamo is my uncle. They say, oh, we saw your uncle somewhere. And when we were younger, he would say, uh, you know that your friend said, ah, 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 don't bring that. <laughs> no, 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 don't bring that. He said, no, I'm just saying, how is she? Said, ah, I don't want to die. Don't ask me. Alamo was good for him. We all called him prodigy. So call him Alamo all this. I, mean, I don't call him Alamo. Prodigy, that's what we all, as nieces and nephews, called him. He loved us. We passed him. And we loved everything that concerning him. We were always there for him to the extent to whatever we wanted, but he was always there for us. So tonight, I don't want us to mourn. I don't want us to remember him and feel sad. I want us to remember him and thank God for God's immense blessings upon his life. Because that's what he wants. He knew. That's what he wants. That he's had a good life. He's had good opportunities. He's had good children. He's had, you know, the kind of life that everybody would want to have. What else was remaining for him? What else? He had all that everybody would want to ask God for. So tonight, I thank you all for coming. And I'm so happy that everybody that has come to talk has talked about him sincerely. There are some functions you go to and they say, oh, this, is, this man is this and that. And you know that it's not quite true. But all of you, his friends have been friends with him all these years. You, you know, that, that, is, that is a testimony of a good character, a man of integrity, a man who appreciates his friends. So we are happy that we are celebrating him. We would always think of him with joy in our heart, that God has brought him into our lives. May we all pray to live our lives to be pleasing to God. In the name of Jesus. My uncle, the Amenaba Kola, King Kuruba Eleki. I also want to recognize all other respected chiefs, ladies and gentlemen. I met Alamo Graham Douglas about 48 years ago, and we have been close up to his death. I was one of his followers who was with him in these trying times. Sometime I believe those were around 11 p.m. and we were talking. And he said, I don't know if I will survive, but if I survive, make sure I am celebrated. That has always been his word. Sometime we will roll him around the hospital. 
and he said, I laughs. Make sure I am celebrated. They will abuse you. They will call you names. There will be confusion. Make sure there is peace. And ensure that I'm celebrated. And I'm happy. Today we are celebrating Alamo. A lot of verses I've spoken, so I won't take the time. I will only speak about Alamo, what he has left behind, what he has done. What can we remember Alamo for? In Port Harcourt today, the Agri Road, supposed to be named after Alamo, he expanded it. It's a record. The road from Emoa to Calabari was Alamo's Hancock. The creation of agricultural local government was Alamo. The creation of Emoa local government was Alamo. The creation of Emoa local government was Alamo. The creation of Payansa was also Alamo. These are legacies that we can remember him. A man will come and will go. Death is an inevitable thing. All of us will come and go. But what will we remember you for? There are three great men in Calabar who sold him a life. Alamo, Toyeko, Eteleko, and Chepadin Oyubo. These three great men took me to the greatest height of my life. My main mafia messenger came from Alamo. And so, as a follower of Alamo, if I want to speak, I will say so many things. But one thing most of us will miss is a dining table. Alamo said, banquet every day is for the poor and the rich. So most of us will miss that dining table. Alamo is a great man. Alamo contested for governorship in 19. 82 and we went to Alamo. I read the scene and I told Alamo they will not support you. He said, No, I'm going to win. I said they will not support you. But what I will do for you is the cola vote I'll give to you. And that was the only vote he had in Alamo. But he never did have it. He contested for the presidency. Myself and Daily Cole were with him. There, he recognized the Kaiba Declaration. At the time, people were afraid to say Kaiba Declaration. And just Alamo recognized the Kaiba Declaration. And Kaiba Declaration today is known all over the country, all over the world. If I want to talk, I will talk and talk and talk. But this few messages is enough. Thank you. You know, I was playing a game, working left and right. I was giving signal because we have 15 more minutes, just 15 minutes for the talks. And I could divide the time. Um, my father loved every single child, all his children, in his own way. We all had our relationships with him. He was an amazing man.
He's my dear. Yes. Awanari, um, Telema, Bikia, also known as Botoka, also known as Bikia, Ibubeleye, Crystal, and Kingsley. He loved us all. And we all had stories about my dad. And we really miss him. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for this. This is like one of the best things that you've done for my dad and us. We've spoken a lot about my dad and um, me especially. I, I was a very sick child, you know, and um, my dad, I remember once I was really ill and I had to go abroad because I had, the doctors here said I had less than 24 hours to leave. And my dad left, we were 11 of us, my dad left 10, 10 the 10, and he took me away. And uh, all my life, my dad has battled trying to make sure everything is okay. Every time I was ill, he would come over, he would get worried and all that. In um, 2015, I had 10 abdominal surgeries and by the, I think it was the 7th or the 8th one, um, my system shut down and I was on life support. And my dad, I had, in fact, my dad was almost going crazy. And when, when I spoke to him about it, he said, they called him to say it's 50-50, so should we turn the machine off? Oh, let it go. He says, let it go for as long as you can keep her alive. My dad was a great dad. We all had our differences. Like everyone said, he would fight, but he would fight with love. Um, the greatest thing I would say about my dad is that when my dad was ill and he knew he was going, every time he'll say, people, I'm dying. And I say that, you don't say that. You know, and then he, in hospital, he always spoke about my late brother. You know, I said to him, um, he, he would say I'm going and I'm going to see Titi and I said to him well the only way you would see Titi is if you gave your life to Christ and he said okay let's go ahead let's do it so we led him to Christ and I believe my dad's in heaven now you know, so that, that's the greatest, the greatest thing I would say my dad giving his life to Jesus so one day we'll meet to pack him tomorrow and we know he's fine thank you very much thank you well, we've all had our differences. Undisclosable differences, yes, I'm the
candles. You know, we're going to do something a little bit uh, out of the ordinary here tonight. Everybody on this front row has been introduced and recognized. I want to now recognize the people at the back. Those at the back, please clap for yourselves. Louder. Louder. Those in the middle, clap for yourselves. We're oh, waiting now. Are they hungry? Can I clap now? Uh huh. I do well. Very soon, I want us to welcome Ete Alabo Graham Douglas to this hall. It's a little bit of a program that we organize. And I think Alaba deserves it. I'm not going to talk about Alaba because he calls me Franco. I call him Yangama. Please wave your legs as we observe a full one minute silence for Alaba Grand Douglas, starting now. Alaba is coming in now. Wave your lights, please. Wave them up. We'll all live to his age. We will all live to his age and beyond. Yes. We will all live to his age and beyond. Yes. Now let's continue with our one minute silence. Wave your lights, please. Wave them. Wave them. May the soul of Alabo T.O.G. Graham Douglas live in Jesus' Lord. And may the soul of all the departed do say, Jesus, my name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. <laughs>